Uh, thanks, Paul, and I'm delighted to be here. Great fan of the Leeds Salon and the work that it does. Um, but I was telling people um, in London that I was coming up to do this meeting, and they said, oh, it's about the future of the UK. And somebody said, oh, you're going to do a detailed economic breakdown of everything that's going to happen now. And I thought, oh, my God, I hope they don't expect that. That is not my shtick, let me tell you. Um, but there are certain observations. And just on that kind of what's going to happen now, which is possibly why some people have come tonight thinking I might tell you what's going to happen now, um, I don't know. Um, but the one thing that everybody has said is that we've got this real problem, which is, is that we have discovered that we haven't got anybody who knows how to negotiate. Mm -hmm. And in a way, that sort of tells its own story about what some of the downsides of being in the EU has meant. I would argue that actually one of the things that happened was is that policy, whilst Britain was in the EU, has been somewhat held back in a kind of infantilised technoc uh, technocracy. So I've actually gone and talked to a lot of people in policy circles who have basically said to us, we don't know what our policy is. All our policy people are used to um, going through EU regulations and interpreting them for us. So we actually haven't got any policy. And this has been in the energy industry, in farming, uh, in education. And I think there is something of a story there which we might reflect on um, as the discussion goes on. But broadly speaking, I am positive. I voted for and campaigned for Brexit. Um, and I do think this is an opportunity to reboot Britain. And there are undoubtedly opportunities as a consequence. However, I do not think it's nirvana. I think that it's a hugely uh, risky enterprise. Um, I just wanted to, uh, the day before the vote came, uh, I got a, a, a Labour Party leaflet through the door, uh, don't risk it. And I think that a majority of people read that leaflet and just thought, I'm going to risk it. I think that people realised and do realise still that it's a risk. And so what happens next, I think, to a certain extent, is quite scary and I understand that people are a bit nervous about the situation in Britain. But I don't want to talk about that so much. I, I want to talk about the responses to the uh, referendum result and what it tells us about Britain today and why I think it might be of some concern for all of us, whichever way we voted. Over the last few weeks since the Brexit vote, there has still been no um, attempt to trigger Article 50, which is effectively the mechanism which would mean that uh, Britain left the EU. Uh, Theresa May, the new Prime Minister, says that she will hold off until she establishes UK -wide, a UK-wide approach to Brexit negotiations. And the first person she went to see was in <coughs> Scotland, um, where obviously Nicola Sturgeon is not keen on Brexit. So we could be waiting a while. And I do think that there is a danger um, of a kind of diluting and fudging and a desperate attempt to avoid taking the consequences of the vote for Brexit. Um, and I think that that is uh, problematic. I think the reason it's problematic and the significance of that delay is that throughout the campaign we were constantly told by the government that they would, uh, quote, the government will implement what you decide. That's what was clearly said. And I think that it is possible that the government is trying to avoid implementing what we as a country decided. Now, why that matters to people, whether you voted Remain or Brexit, and I'm of the opinion now that we might want to move on from saying, are you a Brexiteer or a Remainer, because I don't think it's the most helpful way of understanding society, is what I think is happening is that I think there's a serious danger that democracy is under threat, and that's really what I want to talk about. I mean, I run the Institute of Ideas, and I've been somewhat dismayed that the kind of beyond Ponson and the kind of leading uh, intellectuals in this country have one after another kind of queued up to just say we should overturn this vote, as though that's fine for them to do. So Richard Dawkins in the New Statesman said we need a second referendum after a cooling off period so that the mob can work out what they really think. Uh, A.C. Grayling, Anthony Grayling, a great Enlightenment scholar, fantastically important philosopher, has kind of gone a bit peculiar and uh, has set up this letter which all these kind of uh, uh, people have kind of signed saying it's not in the UK's interest to leave the EU and that Parliament should basically ignore um, the, the, uh, the, the referendum vote and have said that retrospectively there should have been a two-thirds majority for the referendum and that in fact... Uh, uh, people didn't know what they were voting for. 
that's been a kind of constant theme. We've now got, uh, and the ones to really watch who are kind of into undermining democracy are the lawyers. There's over a thousand lawyers who've signed a petition to the Prime Minister calling for Article 50 only to be uh, uh, invoked through a parliamentary vote. They've stressed that the referendum is advisory and not legally binding. Um, and they've called for a royal commission to report on the possible outcome of the Brexit vote before that parliamentary vote and so on and so forth. And when you, um, I, I know a lot of these uh, uh, lawyers, when you kind of follow them on social media and so on, they're explicit about saying Article 50 has not been invoked yet, we've still got time to overturn it. That's the kind of explicit conversation that's going on. Labour peer Una King uh, said that it was only fair and democratic to hold a second referendum um, on, um, because many British people, possibly the majority, she said, were unaware of the far-reaching consequences of the EU referendum. And she said that after the dust has settled, we don't actually know what we voted for. That's what Una has decided. And I think that there's been a whole series of kind of discussions about this idea that people were misled, that there was a kind of mass deception. That, and I think that we have to think what that message is for Democrats. It's effectively saying that people were too stupid to make their own mind up, that they, and effectively the message would be that they were uh, effectively incapable of taking part in politics. I think it does show how fragile freedom is, how the notion of a free individual choosing something is really under assault, and I think that's something that uh, all of us here should be concerned about. So I want to quickly kind of go through who voted what and why, the kind of prejudices on show, and then consider uh, what next. Um, I was involved in speaking at a panel uh, last week, and I'd, I'd like to encourage people here in, in Leeds to get involved in this, which is a new kind of umbrella organisation called Invoke Democracy, which is in fact uh, for people who voted uh, Remain or Brexit, whatever, but are interested in the, in the democracy point. And there were uh, several people on the panel who uh, voted for uh, remain, but they were concerned about the anti-democratic trends. But there were also some interesting and unusual uh, speakers. There were polls for Britain uh, who, who uh, nobody thought, you know, had any kind of purchase, but there they were. There was Gaze for Out, uh, uh, who was the LGBT organisation. There were two trade unionists and a number of people on the panel were anti-racists. And at the very least, I think that it indicated that who voted for Brexit was complicated and not one mass of people, but what they all voted for was to leave the EU. And a lot of the Remain people in the audience said to me afterwards, oh, I was quite surprised because I've never really met a Brexit voter. And I think that there was a kind of sense of a kind of like, are they all knuckle-dragging, you know, stupid, racist, you know, types. Um, I got my hair cut yesterday, you don't have to mention it, um, and, and uh, I got it cut in wood green in the... Um, super cheap cuts place and the hairdresser said to me is there any news on Angela and I thought what is she talking about uh, 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 Angela Eagle anyway she said I wasn't interested I wasn't interested in politics before but now I can't keep I can't I've got Sky News on all the time I want to know what's happening with Angela and uh, Jeremy so we had this chat anyway of course it was that she had got interested in everything in relation to the EU referendum she said oh she said this salon she said We've had more rows and arguments in this salon. And she said, it's like the United Nations in here. This is Wood Green, right? She says, we're from all over the place. She said, we didn't all agree, but we talked more politics. She said, now we're obsessed. And I just, can't, I just wanted to know what your view was on Jeremy Corbyn. Did you think he was a Brexit person? All this. I've had massive rows at the family. And I, you know, she was a hairdresser. I'm sure we all recognise something of this. Certainly where I lived... Uh, uh, where I live, uh, uh, on my uh, local housing estate, uh, everywhere I went, school gates, uh, in the pub, everyone in the build-up to that referendum was talking about what they were going to do, and they took it seriously. Um, and I think that it's an indication of the fact that, you know, that was replicated throughout the country, and that if the EU referendum did nothing else, it captured the imagination of millions of people. I don't want to romanticise it, I don't want to say that people were politicised in, 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 in great depth. But I do think that people were told, they were told by the people who set up this referendum, that the worst thing that could happen was apathy and a low turnout. And what we really need to do was to mobilise. I mean, they actually extended how long you could vote for 48 hours, which is unprecedented, or register for voting. So everyone was like whipped up, told to vote. Um, and, and surely that's what democracy should be like. People were mobilised and thinking and arguing. 
Um, so it's particularly galling that when the public actually got involved, voted in good faith on a question which they were asked by the people who put that question, gave a decisive answer to that question that was an immediate backlash, which immediately said you voted the wrong way. And I do think that the range of powerful forces that were lined up to try and, and subvert the democratic will since then puts us in real serious danger of what people will interpret or take from that. And I think that all attempts at overturning this referendum, which are being openly discussed, um, will actually have an incredibly demoralising and actually negative impact on those people who believed, and they were right to believe, that their vote might have mattered at some point for once, whichever way they went. Um, I think one of the most powerful ways of, uh, of undermining democracy, though, has been the turning on the demos themselves, on the very people uh, uh, who it's been decided did not... Uh, um, uh, uh, were not up to the task of voting. You know, you've got people like Noel Gallagher, whose response was 99% of, th uh, uh, of people are thick as pig shit. Uh, Terry Christian, um, uh, who I kind of generally like, said the retards who totally fucked our country. Uh, a leading scientist, Britain's IQ is considerably lower than previously acknowledged. I think it's worth remembering that when the Chartists struggled to win the votes for all men, I granted, in the 1830s, they were told that the masses were not sufficiently well informed in, in, intellectually to get that vote. And it seems to me that some of the reactions have been the same. The suffragettes were told, quote, the mental equilibrium of the female sex is not as stable as the mental equilibrium of the male sex. And we can kind of like go, can you imagine those kind of attitudes? Well, I think we've seen those kind of attitudes. We've seen those attitudes, sadly, uh, on display in recent weeks. One of the uh, uh, more sophisticated critiques than Noel Gallagher and uh, Terry Christians has been this idea that we now live in a post-factual society. Uh, everybody says that what happened was is that now nobody believes facts anymore. So to give the quote uh, of this kind of new anti-intellectualism, it says, when the facts met the myths, they were as useless as bullets bouncing off the bodies of aliens in a H.G. Wells novel. When Michael Gove said the British people are sick of experts, that equaled anti-intellectualism. And the sort of uh, narrative that's come up is, is that um, everybody uh, voted Brexit because they read that, uh, that uh, message on the side of a bus. And that, that was it. They read one message on the side of one bus and they were completely, that was the end of them. They were conned. Um, and I, I met a, 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 I, work, I work with a lot of scientists. So I met a scientist last week and she said, I don't know what sort of country I live in anymore. She said, I, I, I'm in such despair, I wake up. And she was talking about, she was a, a, an ardent Remain person. And she said, I just, who are these people? And I do think that there is a sense in which she, in good faith, by the way, she's a really brilliant young woman, uh, kind of looks out and sort of thinks, oh my God, I, I don't understand why these people voted in that way. And I think it indicates a kind of sense in which uh, we see these people as the other, as people that we don't recognise. And I think the media, which I do a lot of work for, have got a lot to answer for. I mean, one documentary maker admitted to, or, you know, factual TV mate, uh, maker admitted to me that when they were looking for Brexit voters before the referendum, they looked for fat women with teeth missing. <laughs> I said that in a meeting the other day, and my partner said to me, well, you shouldn't have said that because we could all see your gap in your teeth, which was a particularly unpleasant thing for him to have mentioned. But anyway, um, uh, but anyway the point I'm making is, is that, and, and, and the thing is, since then, um, actually, TV makers have then gone out, and they've actually all gone out, and they've sort of interviewed all these people, and they've sort of said, oh, they're quite, they're quite thoughtful, actually. I, who knew? And it was because in the build-up to the referendum, they really, they weren't even setting it up. It wasn't a kind of conspiracy. It was that they just assumed that was the sort of person. And so they misunderstood something. And I think that the idea that the only reason that people voted Brexit was because they believed the lies of Nigel Farage or because they took as gospel what uh, 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 Gove said or, 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 or uh, Johnson just misunderstands the whole thing. I mean... Most of the leading Leave people, like um, Go, have been dumped, and there hasn't been a widespread rebellion. I mean, people did not vote Leave because Michael Gove told them to. Michael Gove came, went, nobody's noticed, they still voted Leave, right? They worked it out for themselves. Um, I think there's a danger here, and uh, we can maybe talk about this expert point, but this point about sort of the, sci the young scientist woman who I'm talking about, he said, but there were so many experts who told people what was going to happen. Why didn't they believe them? I think, think about what that means for democracy. 
I mean, we might as well just suspend democracy. I mean, if the decision will always be made by the philosopher kings who know better than us, then actually we might as well abandon ship now and just admit that we live in a benign uh, authoritarian state uh, run by the kind of people who know best on our behalf. But I also went and spoke at a number of, or, or went to a number of events organised by organisations like the CBI and the Institute of Directors in the build up to the, the event. And it was extraordinary because there was a kind of, you know, 99.9% .9 uh, kind of support for Remain in those meetings. I was often a lone voice. But where the call was at, where it was said to leading corporates and bosses, what you've got to do is to organise workplace meetings of your workers and tell them what will happen if they vote Brexit. They'll lose their jobs. You've got to tell them. And it just was like serfdom, this idea that the boss would get everyone together and tell people what to do. And I think that we might at least recognise that there's something extraordinarily inspiring about people who didn't take any notice of that. And that actually defied, and it must be scary, because I actually thought, if I'm honest, that Brexit would not win, because I just thought the powers of the establishment were so waged against people they didn't stand a chance, and they would understandably be fearful. Anyway... It, the point about it was, is that nobody voted because of facts one way or another. They weren't duped, but they also didn't vote for facts one way or another. Mm. Like, I'm from a split family, as they say, on the Remain Brexit things, and a, mo a lot of my friends voted for Remain. And the truth of the matter is, is that people voted in the, in, in the uh, uh, referendum often as some kind of a bit like a moral signifier. I mean, most of the people that I voted Remain, but voted Remain, said to me, I'm not voting on the same side as Nigel Farage. I'm an internationalist, I believe in immigration, I'm, I'm outward thinking. And I'd say, what about the EU and democracy? And they'd say, never mind all that, I don't want that. You know, and, so on and, so on. That, and they did that sincerely, this is not a criticism. I understand, they wanted to be associated with what they considered to be the modern progressive outlook. And that's the way people voted in many instances for Brexit, because they wanted to take back control, they had some views about uh, democracy and so on. But it, I just think that we've got to be really careful that when people say that Brexit uh, voters only voted because they had an emotionally rational spasm, that a lot of the people who are saying that are the people who have basically not stopped crying since the vote and keep writing articles, particularly in The Guardian, saying that they're in grief and how are we ever going to get over it and that life will never be the same. You do think, I don't know who's having the emotional spasm. Um, I've written a book on Generation Snowflakes. So I just wanted to kind of think about... Uh, young people in relation to this vote because it's been a fashionable complaint that young genera uh, younger generations um, have been basically selfishly betrayed by, quote, the wrinkly bastards. That was uh, uh, Giles Corrin in the Times. And there's plenty of adults agreeing. So one of the things I'd like to indicate to you is, is that when we hear that young people are complaining about this generational betrayal, it's often old people who are complaining on their behalf and inciting the young people to kind of have a kind of uh, uh, emotional spasm. So you've got uh, Gary Lineker, who said uh, he felt ashamed of my generation. We've let down our children and their children. Uh, James Corden, I'm so sorry to the youth of Britain. I fear you've been let down today. TV presenter Jon Snow, first thing he tweeted was that he went to the bakery where he met two sixth formers who were working for extra cash while studying, and they were in tears. And he says, they are now about to lose the right to study, live, love, and work in other countries. And you think, that's what I call post-factual uh, uh, um, uh, spasm. Shiv Malik, who's the author of Jilted Generation, who, when he wrote it, was young, but is now getting on, so he should grow up, uh, said, on behalf of... Um, I want to say on behalf, there's half of me that wants to tell young people to abandon England, a country that clearly hates them. That's what he said that we should say to the youth. He said, and then he went on and says, well, he doesn't hate old people, but he says that he believes that old people really despise their young. And I think that's a really horrible message to give to young people, that all people who were kind of over 25 voted because they hated the young. And Shiv Malik actually went on the moral maze, which I'm on, uh, some time and actually argued that he thought that uh, young people should have uh, more votes than old people because they had longer to live. And the kind of viciousness which this kind of built up to were kind of a popular tweet that went round, which is, what have you done to us? Hurry up and die. You will not be missed. Um, uh, another one, truly gutted that our grandparents have effectively decided that they hate foreigners more than they love us and our futures. And I think that that unpleasant side, I mean, which, by the way, I would like to point out is um, ageist, uh, just on the kind of um, uh, uh, one way or another. But I do think that that 
sums up a kind of sense in which people felt like they didn't understand each other across generations, across different parts of the country. And I do think that if that's the case, then one thing we can learn is, is that we've got to get out of our echo chambers more and actually go and talk to each other and real people and not caricature each other in this misanthropic and vile way. So I don't doubt, by the way, because I've talked to a lot of, uh, I talk, do a lot of talks in schools and universities, that a lot of young people really are desperately miserable about this vote. And uh, one, one uh, uh, lad who's actually from Yorkshire, might be in, uh, wrote an article in the Times Educational uh, Supplement uh, talk, talking of his despondency and anger. And he says, because my generation will never get its moment in the sun. That's the way he felt. And I just thought that, in a way, that was, again, a very passive kind of view of the future, that he kind of saw himself as entitled to some rosy future that had been taken away from him, rather than as though his future would be mapped out in a fatalistic way by older people. And I actually think that if anything's happened that maybe we should be pleased about, is that we should shake that up, because no one's entitled to anything. We all have to fight for uh, the kind of society we want. I understand that we as a generation were robbed uh, argument, but I don't think that um, we should just see that the future is mapped out or that young people actually should stop saying, why did my parents and grandparents do this to me, as though that's the way that generational change happens. I mean, if they believe in the future, then they need to start shaping it. And um, I also think, though, that there is a certain amount of special pleading which we might want to kind of put into some perspective. So uh, one 21-year-old uh, Glasgow University student uh, complained uh, in The Guardian um, that he had suffered a personal tragedy as a consequence of what had happened. And the personal tragedy was that it was going to jeopardise his plans to study in Romania, Romania on the EU Student Exchange Erasmus programme. And I just felt when I read that, and there's been lots of them, that you had to say, it's not about you. I mean, no disrespect, but you and your Erasmus programme is a bit less important than a major discussion about what the future might look like. So I think that we would, as those of us who are older, do well to consider that when we talk to young people, whether they really ardently believed in Remain or not, or whether you really ardently believe in Remain or not, that just giving in to that kind of like me, me, me scenario is not necessarily healthy. Racism, and, and this is kind of almost where I'll finish, racism is undoubtedly the thorny issue and in many ways the uh, elephant in the room. There's been a, a, a lot of discussion and it's uh, perfectly reasonable for people to be concerned about a spike in hate crimes, about the fact that maybe this vote represented uh, because of the association with the immigration um, uh, um, uh, uh, a spike in, you know, a kind of unpleasant uh, kind of growth of racism in this country. And I think I'd like to hear your views on this, uh, but I would at least like us to look at this more critically. There was a great story about uh, uh, um, some uh, uh, drunk guy in a pub the other night uh, um, uh, attacking a, a Polish drinker. And the landlord just absolutely wouldn't have it. All the locals basically kicked him out, right? Hammersmith, the Polish centre, was had anti-Polish slogans daubed on it. They have been inundated and flooded with local people from Hammersmith going along with presents and apologies and saying, is there anything we can do to help? I use that because I will tell you that there will be some racists who have taken a, a, a sign from this vote and will, as uh, always, kind of go out uh, and be racist, right? I don't doubt that. And I, what I would say is, is that they should be given short shrift. But what is not so much mentioned is that very positive response of local people of all voting directions in that pub and uh, in Hammersmith who, whatever way they voted, oh, I've missed the point about the pub, which was a sort of largely Brexit voting pub. That was the point I was going to make. And so the thing was, that didn't matter, right? That wasn't why they voted and so on and so forth. And it's quite interesting that, you know, some of the people I know uh, who voted Brexit, who kind of whisper it to you, of all people in the world, my local Catholic priest, uh, uh, my mum's uh, priest in North Wales, where she's in at home, is Indian. And he's heard me on the radio, so he's now come out as a Brexiter. So at the end of Mass, he's waiting for me to do a kind of latest uh, what's happening sort of conversation. And he said that the irony is, is that he gets, you know, called a racist enabler. Uh, because he voted uh, Brexit. And w we organised a debating competition for six formers at uh, the Institute of Ideas, and it was just held the weekend after the vote, or the following week, 
And the, one of the Asian teachers who were there came up and also admitted that she'd voted Brexit and that she'd been sent to Coventry and shunned by her fellow teachers at school on the basis of her racism, without any sense of irony. And she was saying to me, you know, I voted Brexit because I did an MA in European politics and I studied the EU and I found out about it and I'm actually pro-immigration, but that wasn't... And, she's, and I'm saying, you don't have to tell me, I understand, right? At the very least, can we notice that it's more complicated? But that immigration is an issue of control and that there is something that people are worried about. But it's also complicated by the fact that in Wood Green, where I live, concern about East European immigrants coming is largely expressed by the other people who live in the local area, which are largely Afro-Caribbean and Turkish immigrants who think that the new waves of immigration are, are causing problems. So again, complicated. But we've got to be careful about the hyperbole that's at the moment being put round by people on you know, the left, and I'm historically from the left, that says that Britain is a new Weimar Republic on the brink of fascism. Because I think that that kind of fear-mongering is irresponsible and, guess what, post-factual. And actually is playing the race card for political ends. I think we end up with fact-free anecdotes about what is called a race, uh, race shitstorm in Brexit, uh, Britain with this idea that everybody in this country is terrified. But I think that people will be terrified if they're immigrants in this country, if everybody who keeps saying to them there is a race shitstorm going on. And when um, there was uh, the Saturday after the vote, there was on uh, social media a picture of five fascists standing outside a metro in uh, uh, Newcastle saying, uh, send them home, uh, which was kind of retweeted millions of times. Uh, you know, it took a number of us who lived in Newcastle to point out that those fascists have been standing outside that metro every year for 25 years with the same banner. And every week they get abused by all the local people in Newcastle. And that was what had happened that week. Now, they might have felt a bit emboldened, but let me tell you that we're not on the brink of taking power in the northeast area. And I think it's insulting to 17 million people to think that. But I also don't want to pretend that I think that 16 million people are accusing uh, 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 the 17 million of being racist. That's not what's happened at all. Most of the people who voted Remain that I know accept the Remain vote. They're not happy about it, they love the EU, they want to stay in the EU, but they have accepted it. But there is nonetheless a highly politicised and febrile atmosphere that I think we've got to uh, 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 challenge. And so I just want to, want to finish with uh, um, somebody who I particularly took against when I read uh, what he wrote after the Brexit vote, because I think it indicates something. It's a Cardiff University cognitive neuroscience called Chris Chambers, who uh, alleged that the referendum, he said, had lanced a boil of hatred and xenophobia in this country before launching, with no sense of irony, into a xenophobic, hateful attack against the Welsh. <laughs> I feel very strongly about this because I'm from North Wales. Anyway, he, this academic, alleges, uh, quote, benefited enormously from EU funding and migration and still voted to leave. He described this as an act of self-destruction as Turkey's voting for Christmas. And just to kind of give you a sense of the kind of misanthropic hyperbole, um, it was more, it's more like turkeys cutting off their own heads off, rolling themselves in, uh, in duck fat, wrapping themselves in foil, and thrusting themselves stump first into the 200 degree oven. Um, he then says, perhaps they just didn't give a shit and thought, hey, this oven looks like a change of scene and that must be good, right? Anyway, neuroscientist, academic, talking about the people in Wales, who, by the way, know that Wales gets more EU funding than any other part of the EQ, e, uh, uh, UK, and still voted Brexit. And why is that? Because the EU money that went in was crumbs off a table, given from on high, and it's not the same as democratic control over your life or wanting the kind of society or having some control over your society. But I do actually think that this uh, neuroscientist had a point when he talked about lancing a boil and also when he talked about a different kind of scene, even though he's talking about ovens. Because I actually think, in a way, the EU referendum has lanced a boil. I just don't think it's brought out all these horrible things. I think it's lanced a boil in as much as it's changed things. And think about what was expected. The government organised an EU referendum that it mobilised everyone to do. And the idea was that we would all go out, vote Remain, and then go back in our box. And life would carry on. Everybody I know in journalism and in politics booked a holiday. Paul booked a bloody holiday. <laughs> Everybody thought, this, that will happen. we'll do it, we'll keep them happy, we'll give them a vote, then we'll carry on. Right, we'll carry on. And what happened was, it didn't work out that way. And that's actually 
how change happens, right? Something extraordinary has happened. I don't want to overstate it, but it is extraordinary. And so I'd say that now, regardless of young or old, or what ethnicity, or how people voted, now we all have a responsibility to grow up, accept the vote, put personal disappointment behind us, and rise to the challenge. And I think that means debating how we build an outward-facing European, if not EU, society. I think that that means we all have to be open-minded enough uh, to uh, uh, have a row with each other but across generations, but also uh, across differences, and actually sort of have a discussion about uh, what the future might look like. And I think that this proves that democracy is beyond a paper exercise, because something really big has happened. Something really, really, really has happened. And I think it might indicate to those young people that I often talk to that change is possible. Because if you remember Margaret Thatcher, she stood up and she said, there is no alternative. There is no alternative. Make do, shut up, this is it. And since then, every time anyone has tried to talk about change or uh, doing something different, have been told there is no alternative. And this vote indicated that there is an alternative and that change is possible. Change, by the way, is always not just positive, but negative. It's disruptive. Historically, it's disruptive. It do, you can't have a big change, like, for example, giving the women the vote, and then everyone goes, oh, it's all the same as last week, right? I mean, every major thing that's ever happened, you know, will have an impact on the markets. You know, you can't have change, and then everything carries on. There will be disruption. It challenges the status quo, it shakes things up, and all historic events do that. But I actually genuinely believe that anything that, uh, that shakes up the status quo and proves to millions of people in this country that what they do politically might just matter has to be for the good. No matter what way you voted, it has to be positive that people now realise that more of the same, the same old in day, out day, sitting at back, fatalistically being done to, has been replaced by us doing something. Now, what we do next matters. And if they don't trigger Article 50 and betray this, we will have some hell of a scary society that we live in. But if we force them to honour what we decided to do as a country, then actually, although I'm scared, I can't say I know what's going to happen. I do think it'll at least be exciting and worth being alive for once. Thank you very much.